have the whole weekend to prepare for the quiz. All right, so I brought a few problems. They're obviously not the quiz problems, though some of them are supposed to be similar. What I have here might not be what you have on the quiz because we might drop quiz problems or because some of them are just meant to make you think and not to give you away the solutions to the quiz. Now, before we get started on this, do you guys have any burning questions or any concepts that you want covered? Based on that, I'll select which problems we do. Yes? Hey, this actually relates <laughs> not too much to the piece that, uh, If you're looking at like the time complexity to like fill in, I don't know, maybe transfer something from one table to another, do you consider, if it takes a lot more time, I would assume, to move the actual item to the new table than it does just to look at your point and be like, oh, there's nothing there, right? So if you're just going to look through an empty table of sides M, like the time to look through that an empty table, is, I'm assuming, is much less than the time to actually move an item. Like, so you're saying we have a... Some table. And things here. Yes. Some might be nil, right? And some might have stuff in them. Yeah. And you're going to resize that to presumably 2 times m. Yeah. And the way you do that is you're going to move the elements presumably by rehashing them, right? Yeah. OK, so these elements, uh, at least when we use Python, we don't really store big elements anywhere. Mm -hmm. If you have a big object, we always work with references to that object. So you remember the address where that object lies in memory. And since the memory is finite and small, addresses are all from 0 to a small number. So they're constant. So what you have here is not a big object. It's the address of the big object. So moving is always constant time. But what about like, just looking at what I'm saying is like, if you had to move, like, say that the table is completely full versus okay. a completely empty table, it would take more time to move. Er everything out of the let's see. full table than it does just to look at the empty table, right? OK, so let's see. So writing something here is order one time, right? Yes. So moving is order one time. Moving one element is order one time. Yes. What's accessing an element in a table, in a list? You have a Python list. What's the cost of doing an index access? It's also order one, right? OK. So order one index, order one move. Suppose you have an empty table. How many indices do you do? How many times do you index? We just look at each one. So it's, it's order one times um, the table, right? M, yeah. Yeah. OK. So if the table is empty, you have order M indices and zero moves, right? Uh -huh. Total running time, order M. If you have a full table, how many indices? How many times do you index in the table? Don't order M. OK. How many times do you move stuff? Um, order M. OK. Total running time? It's order 2M, which is order M. So it, it's, it's very like. So it doesn't matter whether the table's full or empty. OK. OK. Just wanted to confirm that. And this is how you do that. <laughs> okay. OK. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions? OK, then we will go over problems in the order in which I like them, which is easiest to hardest so that I don't have to explain the hard ones. OK, warm up problem one. So you have this recursion, and you have to solve it. And you get a hint. that n to the power of 1 over log n is 2, which is theta 1. So based on the hint, you can see that it's, it's going to involve some math. It's going to get a bit ugly. So how do we solve recursions? Two methods, what are they? OK, substitution formally. But yeah, basically, you expand this guy over and over again. And recursion trees. OK, uh, which one do you guys want to do for this? 
if you only have one t here, anything works because you can keep expanding it, and that works. So we can do either method. Which one do you guys want to go over? Tree. Tree. OK. So we start with the first node. The size of the problem is n. What's the cost inside here? OK. So this creates one subproblem. What's the size? OK. Square root of n equals n. You sold it already, right? What's the cost? Do people remember this? Is anyone confused about what's going on here? OK. So two terms, something involving t and something not involving t. The thing involving t is what we want to get rid of. When we draw a recursion tree, Whatever is in here goes inside here. And this tells me how this number relates to this number. So when I go from one level to the next level, this is the transformation. n becomes uh, square root of n. So the transformation here is the same as the transformation here. OK. What's next? OK. Cost? OK. Do we need to do one more, or do people see the pattern? Silence means one more. If you guys don't speak, we're going to go slow. What's here? What's here? OK. Let's hope everyone saw the pattern. And suppose we've done this for L levels. So we're at the bottom. What should the cost be at the bottom? Oh, sorry, so the cost is, sorry, not, we don't start with the cost. What should the size of the problem be at the bottom? Let's say that this is level h, where h is the height of the tree. Uh, over n? Yeah. OK, so with one, something uh, that looks like what? If the, height of the, if the recursion tree is height i, it's the, it is n to the 1 over 2 to the i, but 2 to the i should equal n, or approximately n. Uh, why? Um, I like that, but why? Because uh, if you have, so we, uh, you need to go to down until you have only you're only looking at one element, and uh, that would be one end of the problem. Okay, so we want this guy to look like one. In fact, it doesn't exactly have to look like one. But what's the advantage if, it, if we manage to get this guy to look like one? We have a recursion. We don't have a base case here, right? A reasonable base case is t of 1 is theta 1. Whatever function that is, if you evaluate it at 1, you're going to get a constant. So you can say that, right? Now, at the same time, I can say that for any constant c, t of c is oops, theta of 1. So if I take this constant here, which happens to be 2, but let's not worry about that. If I take this guy here, I can put it in here. And I know that this guy here equals this guy here. So if I can make this guy here, 
look like this guy here, then I'm done. Make sense? If, if it makes sense, everyone should nod so that I know and I can go forward. Or smile or something. So this should look like one. So this is order one, if not one. Let's make it order one, because it's two in this case. So what's the cost here? One. Everything inside the bubbles is order of already, so I don't need to write an order of. OK, what do we do next? OK, uh, you're skipping one step. So when we have a tree, that's exactly what you do when you have the substitution method. You're going to get to something, and you need to solve the equation. But for the tree, there are two steps. So we need to add up all the costs here, and that's the total cost here. In order to do that, first, we sum up over each level. And in this case, it's really simple, because there's only one node per level. But if you have multiple nodes per level, you have to sum up for each level. And then you have to do a big sum. What's the sum for this level? 1. Come on, guys. You're scaring me. 1. one. Excellent. So the only thing that I'm missing is to know how many levels I have. Because the sum is going to be order h, whatever h is. How do we do that? n to the 1 over 2 to the power of h has to equal this guy. Right? So we have to make it equal because we can only stop when we get to the base case. So we have to expand the recursion tree until we get to a base case, and then we stop. And this is our base case. Yeah. Because this is what the problem says should be our base case. So right, that hint. 1 over 2 to the h is not, yeah, it's, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's not equal to n, n to the 1 over log n. Well, we can set h to be whatever we want. Hi, oh, h is the height of the tree. So we don't know what it is. We have to find out what it is. Oh, I see what you're saying. 2 to the h is equal to log n if you want to make it look like that. OK, let me write, let me write down uh, the equation to make sure you're right. You're probably right because you're thinking faster than me. But let me not embarrass myself and do this the right way. So this equals, OK, so you said 2 to the h is log n, right? Looks about right. So what's h? Log h All right. Log, log n. So t of n is order h. We got this from here. t of n is order h is order of log log n. Math people drowning, right? OK, any questions about this? Yes? Uh, this? Yeah, is that your base? So we, ha we, ha we got a hint with a problem that said n to the power of 1 over log n is 2, which is order 1. Okay. So for the base case, we always want them to look like this. If we don't get a base case, we write our own base case, which is if you plug in a constant, you're going to get a constant. And since we're told that this guy is a constant, that's a pretty good hint that we want to get to it. OK, let's see how we're doing on time. Good. All right, so ready to move on to the next problem? OK, let's do a fun one. Some people might remember it from elementary school, but this time we're going to look at it with a 6046 size. So suppose you have n coins, gold coins. One of them is fake. The fake one is super light because it's not real gold. It's something that looks like gold. And we have a scale. And the scale is super accurate. It can weigh any coins on either side and tell us whether which side is heavier. Perfect accuracy, no need to worry about errors. 
I want to find out which coin is the bad coin. What is the minimum number of experiments I have to do? So there is a strategy, and we can worry about that later. But using 6006, what is the minimum number of experiments I have to do? Not quite. So this is what you think it is. And you can do login with binary search, right? So the problem with binary search is if I put half of my coins on the left, half of my coins on the right, one side is going to be heavier, right? So the answers are going to be this or this. But I never get this. So I only get one bit of information inside, instead of getting one trit. A trit is a base three digit. How many bits of information in a trit? Roughly. It's log two or log three. Log three. And we know that it's base two because that's what we use in CS. So we're discarding a fractional bit of information if we're not allowing for this to happen. So anyone want to try something else? And we have to prove this, by the way. We have to prove the minimum that we come up with. Coin by coin, but that would be yeah. Well, that's end. That's worse. I would like log base four. Okay. So we can, but it's it's definitely going to give us the correct answer, right? Okay. But it's not the minimum number of okay. weighings because we're discarding a possible answer. So if you do binary search, you will never get that the two sides are equal. Log base three would be better because we have three choices all the time. Now let's prove that. So the right answer happens to be log base 3 of n. Let's see how we would get it aside from guessing. So you divide it into thirds and let compare one third and one third and if they're equal then the like one is in the other third. Yeah. If they're not like one. And just keep dividing by three. Wait, what if? OK, so that's the strategy. What if I don't know the strategy? How do I do this without knowing the strategy? people. <laughs> yeah, but then how do you okay, never mind. Just take the two extra like coins and groups. toss them in. So if it's not divisible by three, you add fake coins that are good and I mean you you, you use good coins. There's but we're not worried about the strategy. I want I want us to think of a lower bound. So this is a lower bound for an algorithm, right? You cannot do better than log 3n uh, experiments. Does lower bound, the word lower bound ring any bells? Is there any lecture where we talk about, lo talked about lower bounds? So if you sort and you're using a comparison model, what's the best you can do? And log n. Good. So sorting using CMP, the comparison model is n log n. How did we prove that? One word. Well, two words. Decision trees. Does anyone remember what decision trees are? One person. Comparison thing, right? Or you're like, oh, is it greater or is it less? And is there some sort of question you're asking about each key? Okay, cool. So let's go over that a little bit. So no matter what your algorithm is, it's going to do, it's going to weigh some coins, and it's going to get an answer from the scale, and then based on that, it's going to weigh some other coins and get some answer from the scale. And it will do some experiments, and then it will give you an answer. So if you draw a decision tree, it would look like this. First, we start with zero information. We weigh some coins. Based on that, we have three possible answers. Smaller, equal, greater. Now if we're here, we're going to do another experiment. Three possible answers. 
if we're here, another experiment, three possible answers. If we're here, another experiment, three possible answers. Say we do a third uh, experiment. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. And then suppose we stop. If we stop, we have to give an answer. So this is an answer, this is an answer, this is an answer. Answer, 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 answer. So how many answers do I have at the bottom if I have uh, three levels? So here I have three experiments, so three levels in the decision tree. How many answers? Three to the third, because I start three at the first level, nine at the second, 27 at the third. Each time I multiply by three. So if I do three weighings, I can give at most 27 answers. If I have more than 27 coins, I can't possibly decide which one is bad. Because if I have, say, if I have 30 coins, then I need to be able to give out 30 answers. My algorithm has to have a place where it says the bad coin is coin 1, coin 2, coin 3, all the way to coin 30. Here I only have 27 possible answers. So this isn't going to cut it for 30 coins. I'll need to do one more comparison so that I have a deeper tree. So suppose I have age comparisons instead. How many leaves? So how many possible answers? Age to the age. Almost. Three to the age. Three to the age. So three multiplied by 3 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 3 h times. So 3 to the h. It's no longer equal to 27. So 3 to the h is the number of possible answers. This has to be bigger or equal to n. Otherwise, the algorithm is incorrect. So what can we say about h? So we did all this without even thinking of what an algorithm would look like. Right? This works for any algorithm. No matter how smart you are, no matter how much math you know, your algorithm is going to be bound by this. So the fact that the answer looks like this gives you some intuition for how to solve the problem. If you want to solve the problem now and figure out the strategy, you know that you have a 3 here. So if you divide into 2 every time, you're not going to get to the right limit. So first you do this, you get a lower bound, and then you use your intuition to figure out what the lower bound means. And in this case, it would mean the, the strategy that we heard earlier. You have to divide into three every time and then figure out what you do based on the comparison. So your answer works perfectly once we have this. And also once we have this, you know that your answer is correct because it's optimal. You can't do better than that. OK, any questions on decision trees? So lower bounds are a boring topic in general, right? It, they tell you what you can't do. They don't tell you anything useful about what you can do. But in some cases, being able to reason about the lower bound gives you a hint of the solution. OK, new problem. So suppose we have a 2D map. There's a hill, and you take a satellite picture of it at night, and you get a picture with uh, bright pixels and not bright pixels. So th there are numbers showing how bright your pixels are. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 0, 0. I'm going to draw out an example so we can use our intuition. Zero, zero. One. 
So suppose this is our map. It's w times h. So w of what these are, I think they're columns, and h of the other ones. And you want to find a certain picture inside it. You want to see how many times does a certain pattern show up. Say the pattern is small w times small h, and it looks like this. But this will be the input to your problem. So the pattern might be different. You can't hard code this in. And this is useful. Uh, this problem is called the bunker hill problem. So this is a hill, and this is a bunker. You take the picture. You take a picture of the hill. You want to know where the bunkers are so you can bomb them at night so then you can attack the place. Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. So naive way of solving this. Yep. And then so is this a match, right? That's well, what yeah, yeah. I mean, we can see that's a match. Is this a match? Is this a match? Yeah, by the way, this is a match. <laughs> this is not a match. 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 Now we go down here. This is not a match. This is not a match. This is not a match. So on and so forth. That's what I was suggesting. That's a good idea. So this is. Maybe you're suggesting something smarter, and I don't want to let you do something smarter so that we look at the brute force approach first. I mean, like, I was just saying, take like, the first row of your bunker and then like compare it to other rows, and once you hit that, then check and see if the rest of Yeah, that's a bit smarter. Oh. So that's harder to reason about. Let's take this one and know the running, figure out the running time of it. Does that mean even if you know it's not a match, you keep checking all nine? <coughs> Yeah, say in the worst case, you only find out it's not a match all the way at the end. Wait, are you trying to look for all matches or just one? All matches. So you aren't, you're limited to n squared time almost no matter what, right? If you okay. have a small bunker in a large field, uh, you have to hit the small bunker every time. So are you going to solve the problem for me? Uh, what's the, are we trying to find the most efficient method? No, we're trying to find out the running time for the dumb algorithm first. Oh, okay. Uh, Humor me and let's solve this first and then let's get to the efficient algorithm. Big okay? W minus small w plus 1 <coughs> times big H minus small h plus 1. Plus 1 from? Okay. Um, so it's wh. Yeah. Well, there's something missing here. So this is how many positions I have that I have to look at, right? How much time does it take to compare the small images? All right. Well, this is smaller than wh, which is the input size. So it's scary if you have an algorithm that runs faster than the input size. Because it means you're not looking at all the input. OK. So this is definitely bigger than the input size once we add the w times h here. Don't forget this guy. Uh, so this is the naive algorithm. And if we discard the small order factors, we get that this is order of w, h, w, h. How can you do better? You have the answer, right? Let's let everyone else think for like a minute and then you can give me the answer if you want, or someone else can give me the answer. I guess you should, because you thought of it first. Any ideas? So you're thinking about uh, the input size, right? Someone was thinking about the input size. So. The input size is w times h, right? So if I have an algorithm that's w times h, that's optimal, because it has to look at all the input. Well, we're going to have an algorithm that's w times h. So with that out of the way, does that inspire anyone as to what the solution is? Row, but then you still have a w term, so. Yeah, so let's make it better. It is the correct intuition. Now try to use a trick we learned in lecture to make that faster. Just 
top left corner instead of the whole row. Okay, so we could use the top left corner, and if the top left corner doesn't match, then uh, we don't have to check for matches. So this works for reasonably random data, right? As long as we don't have a lot of false positives, we're going to run fast. Now, if the top corner, so if the top corner of this one, if the map has a lot of ones and then some twos sprinkled all over it, most of the time we'll have to go through the whole image. So we're going to have a lot of false positives. How do we make our false positive rate go down? Looks like a rolling hash problem, exactly. So let's see if we can use rolling hashes. But then you still have that lowercase w term, though. How do we get rid of it? Sorry? Oh, wait, well, we need to be w. I mean, like the running time, if you're just going through one row, it would be big W minus little w. And then times. Um, so where's your rolling hash? Oh, well, you mean like you start with that first row. Oh, I, I guess you can use the entire thing as a hash, too. Like, that kind of works. So we'd want a hash for the whole thing, right? <coughs> so instead of using this Just as row, the hash, yeah. we want a smarter hash. Yes. Yeah. Then you have as you, like, move to the right, you can add those and subtract. OK, so we'd have a rolling hash that, say, has everything in here. And then as I move to the right, I add these guys, and I remove these guys, right? So this is w times h, big W times big H, roughly, times small h, because I have to add. Every time I move to the right, I have to do order h work. Right? So I'm down from this thing to order of w h h. So it's better. It's one step forward. Now let's make this even faster. What if I could do this in order 1 instead of order h? How would I do this in order 1? OK. And then take the hash of like each column. So how, how would we compress them? What the heck? The columns? Right. So it, oh, you, you want to compress the rows? Yes, With, you divide. Are rows? You do, how OK, do let's not compress the rows. Yeah. I mean, oh, I guess you could, you could, I mean, you could take just your, your bunker and then figure out the hashes of the three columns and just run through like that. But, I mean, you still have to access each of those items, so I don't really see how that's faster. I mean, I guess it's, it's less, though. It's less. Maybe it's only one. <laughs> no, you, you yes. Wanna, Last night. So do you want to, like, hash each, like, each, like, little column? Or do you want to hash each, like, each, like, little column of height of the H? OK. Of the of high low H? OK. So we're going to hash all these guys, right? And then we're going to have hashes for them. And we're going to do the regular Robin carp for the hashes, right? Now what happens when I go down? Let's do better than recompute everything. Yep, rolling hash. So if you, I want to make this faster. So I have uh, big W hashes. They're all little h inside. Here I have to compute them brute force. I can't do anything better. But when I go from here to here, there's only one element going out and one element going in. Same for all these guys. Let's not make the picture uglier than it needs to be. So I have big W rolling hashes. They're vertical rolling hashes. And then the rolling hashes hash uh, columns. So my, so my window, the sliding window that I have, is little w rolling hashes. Each rolling hash is little h in size. So it's a hash of hashes. It's nested hashes. And then when I go down, I, I only have to roll down each of the rolling hashes by one. 
So that's constant time. So to go from here to here, so to, to slide the window one down, I have to roll this hash down, roll this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And all of them roll down in constant time. So when I'm adding a column to the hash, say I'm here, and I want to go here, I roll down this hash, and I have the answer. So it's order one. I'm adding it in order one. Does this make sense? But it's not too bad, right? It's, it's one more. The vertical roll first, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So to make the sim to have the simplest possible code, you start with big W rolling hashes, do rubbing one D rubbing carp, you roll everything down, one D rubbing carp. Right. And keep doing that. Okay, what's the running time for this? WH. WH. Does this one have a space of flexible W then? Because you store Yep. So my memory requirement went up to four W. <coughs> OK, is everyone happy with this? So it's one of the few cases where one, uh, an approach for solving a 1D problem generalizes to 2D. In most problems, you have to rethink the whole situation. OK, let's do a hard problem. Enough with the easy ones. Two lists, roughly size n. But they're both sorted. Let me fill them out with random numbers. Five, 13, 22, 3, 7, 9, 15, 19, 24, 28, 32. So I have these lists. Let's be generous and say that all the numbers are different. They're sorted. I want to find the nth number, so the number with rank n out of both lists. As fast as possible. Well, so the thing is, if, for example, n is 1, then it's this. Yep. This is the second number. Combine. This is the third. So, okay. Sorry, so if you take the lists and you combine them, then I want the result out of, the, out of that. OK. Full merge sort and log n? No. Well, it's already sorted, though. OK, so what it do we do? Merge, so let's just order that. So merge, right? OK. So merge and then index is the first approach, which is order n. Then you say run the merge algorithm, but stop when you get to the little nth element. So that's a little bit better. And we don't have to produce an array, so the space complexity is down to order one, right? Okay. Now let's do. Uh, yep, exactly. This is linear. We have to get to logarithms. How do we get to logarithms? Um, do a modified binary search. Okay. So, like, what if you like, first looked at? Um, Actually, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? So modified binary search. Do you know the full answer, or I, do you want to start looking at the solution? I have an idea. OK. Let's see, how, let's see how it would work. Um, OK, so if we take the, um, the n for uh, second element on each, or sorry, at the end of our second element on each um, row. Um, the one 
that is lower, um, that's at least the end of our second element. And the one that's higher is uh, So let's say that this is our n1 and n2 to yeah. make this, and they're both order n initially. So this is n2 over 2, if this is small. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, so that's at least the, um, uh, the lower one is at least the n over second element, since everything before it is uh, um, since everything before it is, um, what you call it, um, is less than it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so this is n over 2 or greater, right? Mm -hmm. This guy. Um, so then we know that, um, we also know that uh, it has to be greater than the, that uh, the element above it is at least the nth element, or, is, yeah, at least, sorry, it's at most the nth element because um, uh, it's greater than, um, so it's the most n <coughs> plus n2 because that's how many you have in total. And you know that the one on the top, you know that these ones are bigger than it, right? Yep. But you don't know anything about this, these ones. Mm -hmm. So it's minus n1 over 2, right? So it's at most n1 over 2 plus n2, the top element. OK. So. Um then we can uh, take the, ele uh, the element halfway between, let's uh, three quarters of the way through and two and one quarter of the way through and one and just do more with our useful comparisons. Or is, is that the, the, the element someone pick? Uh, yes. Okay, so you're saying that if, uh, so let's see what happens in each case. So if little n is here, then you divide. So if n is smaller than this, right, mm -hmm. then you chop them up here, and you've divided the problem into half. Yep. You're good. If uh, it's bigger than this other number here, you've chopped the problem up, and you're here, you're good. Yep. Now, the hard case seems to be when it's in between. So what do we do then? Between taking the upper half of the bottom one and the lower half of the upper one, right? If between 15 and 43, then you take everything with the upper half of n2, you take the lower half of n1. Okay? Yeah, you, always, you should always be taking the upper half of one and the lower half of the other, in this case. Wait, really? Yeah. So, so um, <coughs> every, uh, in list n2, everything less than 15 is um, 15 is at least the, n the nth over two elements. Yeah. Uh, I think we're using but too many nths at the same time. Are you using the little n <laughs> or the big n? Yeah. yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm using, uh, we have uh, so one nth element in the uh, lists are called n, and this is confusing. Um, can we rename the nth element to something like m or some other useful number? The kth element. OK. So the 15 is at least uh, the kth over two element. So it can't be anything on the left half Wait, of the. K over two? Why k over two? This list is size n. Oh, sorry. We, uh, we didn't, I uh, didn't pick the elements at um, n over 2. I picked the elements at k over 2. OK. So why would I do that? Thanks, Rick. So if, like, if, k is if n1 is greater, greater than k, then I chop off the end of the list, right? If n2 is bigger than k, then I chop off the end of the list completely. Right? If this list is sorted and I want the third element, I know that these are not the answer. No matter what's down here, these are not the answer. Yeah. So I know for sure that k is going to be bigger than n1, n2. So instead of going at there, let's go at k over 2. And here, let's go for k over 2. So now, now this one looks a bit nastier and 1 plus and 2 minus o oh, stays what it was before. OK. OK, so um, 
on the list where the, you got the element that was lower, um, you know that everything to the left of it is um, less than uh, k over two, or is like is uh, is uh, it's not it has to be lower than the element number is lower than k over two. So we're not doing anything to the left of the fifty. You can kill that section of the list. Okay, so we can kill it. Yep. But then, what's the rank when I recurse? How am I going to know the rank that um, I'm looking for? K minus what you kill. So, uh, you you say you can save the you can save the. Oh, ranks. sorry. So you want to kill this guy, right? So you want to kill these numbers. Mm -hmm. But here I have k over two numbers. Yep. And here I have k over two numbers. How do I know that is not somewhere here? How do you know that what's not somewhere there? Well, so you have to you compare like 15 and 43, right? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, you see that 43 is bigger, you see 15 is smaller. Mm -hmm. So then you would look at, um, you would go to, I guess, k over 4 index in M1, right? And like 3k over 4 in uh, N2. So when you recurse, you say that you've killed k over 2 elements. I think you can also kill everything to the right of 43. 40, yes, is, you can kill everything to the right of 43 since it can't be okay. so, those elements. So basically, yeah, that one. And you can kill everything to the left of 15. And then you recurse, uh, you repeat the algorithm again with yeah. the lists you didn't kill, except you um, also put in a term of the you've already covered k over 12. Yeah. OK. Does that make sense? So we want the element with rank k over 4 over these lists. Yep. So next time I'm going to have, uh, so I know for sure that what I have is either k over 2 or less than k over 2. Uh, yeah. Right, so this is less than k over 2. And then I'm looking for a rank of k over 4. That seems to work. What, how does the running time look like? It should be O of log k. Wait, I think it's log So log k, log n1 plus n2. Are these different? Yes. If k is 1, you know, it should only, the algorithm should only take a runtime of something like, oh, should only recurse once, even if n is 20 million. OK, so. Um, but if k is 20 million and the list's length is 2 million long, it'll take approximately the list length to run. OK. So what, what gets reduced is aside from the list size, from the list size, k gets reduced. Right? And k seems to define the input size for the next uh, iteration, because I'll have at least k over two elements in one of these buckets. So sounds like it should be log k. OK, now k is uh, smaller than, k is bigger than n1 and 2. But it should hopefully be smaller than the sum, because otherwise, why am I doing the problem, right? So this is definitely order of n1 plus n2. So this is a bound. This is a slightly tighter bound. OK, we have a different solution to the problem which is uh, all the possible solutions are hard to argue. They all come down to something like this. Uh, the one that we have uh, requires you to use, you have two indices. And you know that the sum of the indices is k. And you do binary search on the top and adjust the index on the bottom to match, to keep the constraint that the sum of the two indices is n. And you can look at that in the notes that we're going to post. OK, are you guys tired? Do you want to look at one more thing, or are we done? <laughs> OK, let's try to look at. OK, let's look at something reasonably easy. Uh, oh, no, you, can, you guys can read this on your own. I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, so suppose you have some uh, functions 
and we want to order them according to their asymptotic growth rate. Do people remember how to do this from PSET 1? So the idea is that you take each function, you simplify it, and then you sort them. So let's have a couple of simple ones and then some hard ones. And we're going to stop in five minutes. What's this? OK. Um, let's see. Uh, and choose three. What is this? OK, very good. Why? Something that chooses like n times mx1 times mx2. It's a over mx2. 1 times 2 times 3. So yeah, this comes out to be roughly n cubed. Cool. Uh, what do I like? Uh, how about n plus log to the fourth of n? Yep. So even if we have a polynomial in a logarithm, it's still dominated by pure n. Now, suppose we want to order these guys together with, uh, let's see, which one doesn't look boring at all? Uh, n to the log n and 2 to the n. Let's sort them. Which one's the smallest? Which one's the biggest? Uh, let's start with the smallest ones because I think it will make that will be easy. So which one's the absolute smallest out of all these guys? Okay. Then cube and fourth. So we have to compare these guys. How do we compare them? And to the power of log n and two to the n something. Take, take the logs. So when we have something confusing with exponentials, take the logs and see what we get. Logs are monotonic, so if you take the logs, you'll have the same relationship afterwards. So log of this is log of n to the power of log n. So it's log n times log n. So it's log 2n log of 2 to the n is n. Which one's bigger? Uh, All right. Oops. All right, and we're not going to solve this, but how would you go about solving this guy? What do you do to it? Sterling. Sterling. Yep. You do Sterling, you go through the numbers, and you figure out the answer. And then you, if you have to do logarithms, use logarithms to figure out where it belongs among these guys. Wait, what's Sterling? So there's formulas that gross thing is all the form thing in here? So Sterling says that n factorial is okay. oh, ugly 2 pi n over, oh, sorry. 2 pi n here times n over e to the power of n. So what's this binomial? What's the formula for it? OK, formula for n choose k. Anyone? OK, so in this case, it's n factorial over n over 2 factorial raised to the power of 2, right? And then we chalk through the math and get to some answer. <coughs> All right? OK. Have fun. <laughs>